This is episode 69 with organic vegetable farmer, foodie, recipe maker, and author, Andrea Bemis. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op, the brand who helps get you outside through gear, classes, and adventures. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy the show. There's a lot of made-up careers in the world, but being a farmer who grows food we eat is something we actually need to survive. We got to eat. Someone has to grow our precious food. There's been so many times I've wanted to leave it all to be a farmer, to live off the land and feed my family and other people along the way. Well, Andrea Bemis and her husband, Taylor, are doing just that. They're organic vegetable farmers in Parkdale near Hood River, Oregon, and they own a six-acre organic vegetable farm called Tumbleweed. Andrea shares how she got into farming, what she would have done if she wasn't a farmer, which is about as opposite as one might imagine, what she's learned from working on the land, the realities of farm life, and how she turned her passion from being a farmer and growing and cooking food into a really successful blog and cookbook called Dishing Up the Dirt. Andrea is a delightful storyteller. She has a great message of having a simple dream and sharing community through food. Enjoy. All right, we have Andrea Bemis on the show. Andrea, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. So excited to have you on. Shelby, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so a wild idea to be a farmer. I think we all have this, I do, I have this idealistic picture of what it's like to be a farmer in my head and thought I could do it. Maybe you could break it down for us first, how you got the wild idea to have an organic farm, be a farmer, and sort of the reality of what it's like. Yeah, you know, the long and short is I did not grow up with a farming background. I grew up in the suburbs of Portland, Oregon. Um, but my husband, who I met, gosh, like 14 years ago um, this past summer, he grew up on an organic vegetable farm in Massachusetts. And when he was growing up, he he had no desire to, to go back to the farm and and work the land or take it over. I think growing up in, you know, kind of the farming world, he was sort of anti-farming. Um, so he moved West as soon as he could. He wanted freedom because I think he could see his family was, was tied down to the farm. But we, we started dating and we kind of bounced around from my husband's a big time skier. So we bounced around, you know, ski town to ski town. We were in Colorado for a while. Montana and Oregon. So what ski towns were you in real quick? Cause I know there's a lot of skiers. So we were in Aspen for a couple of years. We were in Montana in Montana. We actually weren't in a ski town. We were living on a, on a dude ranch um, outside of Missoula. Awesome. Very random. And then we were in Bend, Oregon. So we were, we were near bachelor and we, we were loving life. I mean, we were kind of living paycheck to paycheck and living to have fun, which was great, but it started to get a little exhausting. And in me in particular, I kind of, I just wanted a little bit more meaning out of the day-to-day grind. And I started to get a little bit more into cooking and knowing where our food was coming from. And we were actually Taylor's, he's my now husband. He was my boyfriend back then. But we, every year, his father would send us out overnight as a big box of blueberries from their orchard back in Massachusetts. And we went for a a big hike outside of Sisters and we packed up a bag of the blueberries and we were, you know, I don't know, halfway through this hike and dipped into the bag of blueberries. And I just had this this sounds kind of cheesy, but this like epiphany of like, I want something different from my life. I want to go back to where these blueberries were grown. I, you know, I want to get my hands dirty. I want to do, I want to grow food. And I, I expressed this to Taylor and he was like, I've been thinking about this for over a year now, but I never thought that you would be up for, for moving to the farm. 
he was almost too scared to ask um, or to bring it up. And so we like had this awesome moment of like, let's bail on, on life out here. Let's go, let's go work the land. And he was convinced that his dad, you know, if we called his dad, he knew his dad would be like, yes, you know, you guys have jobs if you, if you want them. Um, awesome. And we literally, we got off the mountain, we got off the mountain. We called his dad. His dad was teary eyed. He was so excited to hear that we wanted to come and, and work on the farm. So we pretty much packed our bags within the week and, and, and drove East to the vegetable operation out there. So I know you, you kind of cut your chops on, you know, Taylor's vegetable farm, which is incredible and lucky at the same time, but I'm sure it was really hard. So I'm really curious, you know, what does growing food teach you? What's it taught you mostly about life? Um, that, so, well, I will say backing up Shelby, I had this, like this romantic vision of, of working on the farm with, with my then boyfriend and his family. And my gosh, we, we got out there and it's a big established farm. It's been there since the sixties. And it's like a crew of, there was a crew of 12 to 15 of us. Mm. And I had never worked in a garden before. So I was, I had no, I had no idea what, what I was doing. And it was the first three months, you know, when you have that lump in your throat that if somebody's going to ask you how you're doing, you're going to burst into tears. Yes. <laughs> I, I had that lump in my throat for, for the first couple of months we were there because I, I felt like I couldn't hack it. Um, it's, hard, hard physical labor. And we got thrown in with the wolves. We followed along with the, with the pros and, you know, asked questions and tried to keep up, but it toughened me up real quick. You know, you, you're in charge of hauling all of your own, you know, potatoes or carrots. So you, you know, hundreds of pounds of, of produce and, you know, you don't really ask for help a lot. Um, but yeah, the physical labor was something that I hadn't given a lot of thought to before we we got out there. And in the end, that's actually something that I've learned to love because you just sleep so damn well. And I'm sure that you can like relate to that with like syrupy, anything that you do. So, you know, till you're physically exhausted. But yeah, you know, we we learned the ropes. We got thrown in with the wolves. But slowly over time, the tasks became a little bit easier and we got out to the farm in the springtime. Um, so we were spending a lot of time in the greenhouses or out into the field transplanting, you know, lettuces and, and all the greens. Um, but once we started harvesting food, that's when there was like this connection that was made. I could just, I could see literally the fruits of our labor. You know, I was like, God, I, I remember you know, seeding that lad that had a lettuce in the greenhouse, you know, six weeks ago. And here we are, you know, harvesting hundreds of heads of lettuces and damn, the salad's going to taste really good that I'm going to eat for lunch. Yeah. It's, it's a simple life, but it's tough. I mean, the only experience I have was working on a farm in New Zealand and it was the hardest thing ever, but I didn't even know how potatoes were ever harvested until I did it. I'd never even seen how onions grew until... I saw them, you know, I just seen them at Vons or the grocery store. So I relate a little bit, but I'm fascinated by this farm life because it's something that I've always wanted to do and you kind of did it. So tell me really quickly, how did you go from then owning your own farm and what do you grow now on it? Yeah. So the operation that we were on back East was, it was a really large farm it was 60 acres, which in the, in the vegetable farm world, 60 acres is, is pretty big. So we decided after we were there for three years, we were kind of yearning to be back out West. How old were you at this time? Really quickly. So at this time, um, okay. So I'm 34 now. We were 28. Okay. 27, 28. And so we decided that we wanted to to venture out on our own and have a smaller a smaller farm and and kind of be near the mountains we were sort of missing the mountains and um and so with yeah three years of farming under our belts we felt 
you know, fingers and toes were crossed, but we felt like we, we had a good handle on, on things. So we packed up our bags once again and headed back to Oregon and which we landed in, in Parkdale, Oregon, which is an hour and a half east of, of Portland. Um, and we chose this area mainly because we still wanted to be close to a city so that we would have an outlet for our, our vegetables. I know a lot of, a lot of farmers, you know, you end up hours away from, from your, your largest market. And that just, that can be really tough. Um, so we wanted to make sure we were, we were close enough to a city. We were close to the mountains. And we also chose this area because there weren't a lot of vegetable farmers. There's a lot of farms. There's a lot of orchardists. So we grow a lot of fruit in this area, but there was definitely a need for, for organic vegetables. Um, so that's kind of how we landed in this area. And our first year we leased land. We didn't have enough money to buy any land. And we also wanted to make sure that we could hack it, um, that we could actually grow vegetables in this climate. And that even though we felt there was the need for it, but we, we wanted to make sure that there, that people were actually stoked to buy organic vegetables. So for our first year, we just leased two acres from um, a couple that actually had their, their land is just two miles up the road from where we live now. But that first year we did well. And we decided we were on the hunt for our own land. And we, we landed on six acres, two miles down the road from, from that first farm. And uh, we live and, and, and work on, on Tumbleweed Farm, which is where we are today. This will be our, our fifth year on this land and our sixth year farming on our own. Wow. So six years as a farmer, what do you, what do you grow on your six acres? Because to me, I thought six acres was actually small to have a farm. But it sounds like you can grow a lot of vegetables in six acres. Oh my gosh, you can grow so much. Um, so we can feed hundreds and hundreds of people on six acres. That's incredible. Um, and we we grow everything from, you know, beets, carrots, salad greens, kale, broccoli, potatoes, squash. We grow we grow about fifty five different varieties of vegetables. So I still have this like idealistic version of this farm. It sounds incredible. I'm looking at your book, like the pictures are beautiful. You also have perfect bangs. I'm so impressed. So, so what's, <laughs> what are some of the most brutal lessons though you've learned from farming? Like, and what are some of the worries? Like I know deer could just come in and eat the whole crop or bugs. I mean, it's organic. So kind of what are some of the brutal lessons yes. you've had to learn? Oh my gosh. Well, there's a lot. First of all, one of the the lessons that you learn really fast is you can't leave your property. I mean, so the spontaneous life that we used to live, that is gone. Um, somebody has to be here pretty much 24 seven. We also have animals. We have chickens and pigs, but somebody has to be on premise pretty much all the time. So, you know, we have missed all of our, you know, friends' weddings or, you know, we, will rock, paper, scissors, who gets to go for 24 hours to the East coast or something like that. So yeah, you're, you're really, the, your freedom kind of goes out the window and you really are like a slave to the weather that we check our weather apps on our phone all the time. It's the first thing we check when we wake up in the morning. It's the last thing we check before bed. If it's going to, if we're getting close to a frost, you know, we we're at a little bit of elevation and we've got greens out into the field. We have to go out and, you know, the late evening and, and put these floating row covers over, you know, hundreds of feet worth of, of lettuces. There's the threat of deer, which I am no longer a fan of deer. I used to be a, veg I used to be a vegetarian <laughs> until I became a vegetable farmer. Really? Um, Tell me more and, about this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I learned really quickly that vegetable farming is not vegetarian. Um, we are killing bugs we're killing gophers and this is all organically but we'll set traps out um we'll kill we'll hunt deer if they're on our property and then also we need you know animal waste to 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 put back into the soil and so all of a sudden I was like wait a second why am I vegetarian when I could really be eating pretty locally and sustainably if I actually ate some animal products 
So mm, interesting. It went full circle for me. Yeah. But yeah, you know, the there's a lot of threats and, you know, crop devastations can happen. You can get a random disease. It doesn't rain here in the summertime, ironically, because Oregon's such a rainy state. But once July hits, we're pretty darn dry until October. So we're constantly moving irrigation around. And if, you know, there's irrigation troubles, you know, we can we can get wiped out really quickly with newly transplanted greens. And so the stress level, my husband likes to say, it's like panic mode from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep. And then you wake up and it's panic mode again all day, every day. But for some reason, we're still doing it. <laughs> it's great. And you guys work together. So who does what and how has your relationship changed since you've really started to work together? Yeah. You know, when we were, so we've been farming on our own for six years and we were three years back East. And when we were on the farm back East, a lot of our chores were different. Um, he did a lot of the mechanical work. So he was on the tractor all day, every day back East. Whereas here, and he still does a lot of the mechanical cultivation and tractor work on our farm, but we do a lot of tasks together. So we're both you know, hand planting, all of our transplants, we're harvesting together, we're washing together. And it, it's interesting working with your partner 24 seven, we rely on each other big time. So there's a lot of trust. You know, we both want the best for our business. And but we both have, you know, it's good to divide and conquer too. So there's, we do a lot of things side by side, but then we do have, you know, there, I take care of the animals. I take care of most of the greenhouse work. He takes care of most of the irrigating and, um, you know, the tractor breaks down. He's welding parts or he's become really good at, he's like, you know, when you're a farmer, you have to be a mechanic and a welder. You have to be able to fix anything and everything. Um, so thank God for YouTube. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because we've we've learned how to do a lot of a lot of things via YouTube if if something breaks down or a pipe explodes. But yeah, so it's it's good working together. And I mean, yeah, we we get to, you know, wake up and drink our coffee together, eat breakfast together, lunch together, dinner together. I mean, it's a lot. It's not for everybody. It sounds awesome and really good for your relationship and like you guys have figured it out, but how financially stable is it? You know, I've always wondered, like, how do farmers make money? You, you have a CSA. Maybe you can talk about what you guys do. Do you guys do farm-to-table dinners? Yes. And so, Shelby, that almost goes back to what you were saying when you were like, gosh, six acres seems really small. For vegetable production, I think being on smaller acreage is financially a lot better because – so we're always, like – you know, rotating our crops, we do succession planting all year. So we do, we're growing lettuce for 30 weeks out of the year. So every week we're transplanting every week, once a week for 30 weeks, we transplant 500 heads of lettuce out into the field and you're able to be rotating. So you can really maximize your space and make a lot more money. So it's not, we're not doing one and done crops. We are doing succession planting. And, you know, our first couple, our first two years out here, we weren't making, we were breaking even. And so we were moonlighting as my husband was a bartender and I was a waitress. So in the evening, we'd work all day, be out on the farm, you know, from 5 a.m. to 3.30 in the afternoon, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then go and do these side gigs wow. to actually make some money. But we, we no longer really have to, well, we still kind of have side gigs, but we were able to fulfill, you know, a lot of the restaurant demands. We do the local farmer's market. And then we started a CSA, which I'm not sure if, if everyone knows what that stands for, but it's community supported agriculture. And basically families will buy a share into your farm. And so they'll pay, you know, for us, it's, $780 for 27 weeks worth of produce, which ends up being less than $30 a week. That's great. But yeah, so for less than $30 a week, you get a box of in-season vegetables. 
And so, and we have 65 families that we, that we cater to right now. And we're going to grow every year. We kind of are growing that number. And this is our first year we've hired help. And now that we've hired help on the farm, we can, we can grow that number, but we're able to make a living now. Finally, after, you know, six years, we're able to make a living off of farming. And I mean, we're not going to Hawaii. We're not taking crazy vacations, but we're, we're able to pay the bills. Well, hats off to you. That just sounds awesome and impressive. I mean, good for you. you guys had side hustles. You went after it. You did it. And I love the fact that you guys had a side hustle while you were going after your dream and funded it. So you guys aren't trust fund kids. Yeah. I mean, what, what would you have done if you weren't a farmer? Do you have any idea where your path was going? I, well, this is a total, yeah, I would have been giving facials for a living because I went to beauty <laughs> school. Um, so yeah. That's that why your bangs me. That are just, so awesome. That's, I actually have a really funny story about my bangs. So I cut bangs six years, pretty much as soon as we moved here. So like I said, we don't get off the farm very often, except for like delivery days. And so I really liked delivering to our restaurant accounts because the tailor would stay up at the farm. I'd hop on the truck, blast the AC and take the long way to like every single, every single drop. And I ended up going and getting my bangs cut from this lovely woman who I adored. She would crack open a beer in the middle of the afternoon for me. And I was like, God, bangs are kind of high maintenance. So I've got to get these cut every couple of weeks. But I have kept the schedule every few weeks when I'm delivering vegetables to restaurants. I will swing in, get my bangs trimmed, have a beer, come back up to the farm, and my husband has no idea. <laughs> so I love it. It's pretty sweet. I yeah. know you're wondering, why are we asking about bangs on Wild Ideas Worth Living? But hey, that, that's all part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Some, sometimes you just, yeah, you got to you have bangs. Okay, so you're on your way to basically be an esthetician or do facials. Yes, I was, I was on that path and, and I'm, so I'm severely dyslexic. So I didn't graduate college. I dropped out after a year. Um, traditional education just is not, was not for me. And so, yeah, when I went to beauty school, the most attractive thing for that was that I'd be using my hands. Mm. And so giving facials, I did that for a couple of years. I wasn't into it, but it also allowed us you know, I was doing that when we lived in Aspen. I was doing that when we lived in Bend. I could move anywhere with that, yeah. with that trade. But yeah, I definitely do not need to, to touch another, another person's face <laughs> for the rest of my life. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. When we come back, Andrea shares how she got a book deal and launched another career around her passion for cooking as well as the amazing things she says and does to start her day. This episode was brought to you by Altessa, a series of outdoor events designed for women who long for a life of discovery. So whether it's committing to a three-day weekend retreat on a mountaintop or an energetic one-day outdoor festival featuring female artists, music, and speakers, Altessa has your outdoor aspirations covered. The great thing about Altessa is women from all walks of life come to connect or even reconnect with themselves and each other in the outdoors. I'll be at some Altessa events this summer, and I'm really stoked to be part of this amazing event series. There's also some great brands involved who make this event possible and are helping lead various activities. So thanks to partners like Subaru of America, Garmin, Osprey, Sea to Summit, Smart Wool, The North Face, Hydro Flask, Pro Bar, Solomon, Maui Gym, Black Diamond, Yakima, Olakai, Roxy, Igloo, and Leatherman. Find more about the REI Altessa events at altessa.com. That's O-U-T-E-S-S-A dot com. You know, you became this amazing cook and you have this great book, Dishing Up the Dirt, sitting on my kitchen table. I was like last night, I was like, Johnny, I'm done being vegan. Johnny's my partner. I was just like, <laughs> I'm looking at these recipes and I was like, I'm done. It's so depriving. Like, look how good all this food looks. And I know a lot of your dishes are vegetarian and vegan, but it's just beautiful. So let's talk about how you transitioned, you know, to cooking because that's really attractive to, to a lot of listeners, you know, cooking from the farm to the table. That's 
pretty in right now. Yeah. You know, that happened for me mainly because when we were back East, we were growing all of these vegetables that I had no idea. You know, I didn't grow up eating beef and rutabagas and turnip. Yeah, beets. Like, what do you do with them? And kohlrabi. And kohlrabi. Oh, my God. Well, I'll tell you. I got, <laughs> you know, I've got hundreds of recipe ideas. Yeah, I just, I had no idea what these vegetables were. We were breaking our backs, growing them and harvesting them. So I kind of made a promise to myself that if I was going to ruin my physical body farming, that I would at least eat well and learn to and learn to eat these particular vegetables. So it was trial and error in the kitchen. Um, and farming is really monotonous. So you can be out in the field, you know, thinning beets for hours. And so I just start dreaming up, you know, what I'd cook at home and maybe the beets were in the field next to the fennel. And so I'd be like, I wonder, you know, maybe I'll make something with beets and fennel. Maybe I'll roast beets and fennel together and, and put them on a pizza or, you know, make a, a risotto with beets and fennel. So I just started to play around with flavor combinations when I was out in the field, just kind of fantasizing what we'd eat for dinner. And that's kind of how the cooking came about. Again, I did not know what I was doing at first, but, but it was really fun to experiment with, with new to me vegetables and to learn that, that vegetables when they're fresh and, and grown, you know, organically, they're, they're really, really delicious. So even vegetables I thought that I hated, I, I really had never eaten the real deal. So uh, I had a lot of time on a day-to-day basis to, to dream about what will be whipping up in the kitchen for dinner. So then you ultimately started this blog, Dishing Up the Dirt, that became a book. And you, at some point, started taking pictures of food and the recipes and concoctions you'd make. Did you have photography skills? Did you kind of YouTube it? You know, what was your tactics? And how did this come to be? Yeah, so I guess two things. One is, once we broke out on our own, I knew that in order to get people to, to buy certain things at the farmer's market, or for our CSA members to want to sign up and join our CSA again, they would need to know like what the hell to do with some of these vegetables. And ironically, we're really good at growing the not so popular vegetables, which is kind of a bummer. I wish we could be growing like, you know, all this other, you know, traditional stuff, but we grow, we grow a lot of traditional stuff, but we also grow, you know, a lot of those more obscure vegetables like kohlrabi. Kohlrabi. And- I was just going to say, that's so weird. Kohlrabi. Maybe, yeah. then give us a recipe with kohlrabi at the end too. It'd be great. I'll get, I'll give you a recipe at the end because it's one of my favorite vegetables. But yeah, I just, I was like, we need to give people an idea of what to do with, with a lot of this stuff. So I, you know, I had my blog and I started creating recipes with, you know, a lot of the vegetables that we were growing. And then I also was like, I'm not, I'm so visual. So I'm like, no one's going to cook a recipe for kohlrabi if they can't see what the finished dish looks like. So I started to, um, play around, you know, at first I was taking photo, all my food photos with my phone and then back to YouTube. Thank God for YouTube. I got a nice camera. I inherited my husband's grandfather's camera and he had a nice nice. Canon. And so I like, yeah, it was, it was a sweet score, um, but I didn't know how to use it. So then I just YouTubed, you know, food photography, Canon and, um, and started to play around. I got a lot of food photography books and, and really just, that was another thing that I kind of moonlighted. I would geek out at night and, and play around with, with my camera and, um, and playing around with, you know, plating, plating food to try and make it look pretty and appetizing. So folks would want to cook and eat, eat the, the recipe or the food that we were growing. I, I love it. I, we did a podcast with Eric Wolfinger. He's a pretty famous food photographer now, but he started taking pictures of surfing. And then he traded bread baking lessons for surf lessons with a guy who ran Tartine, this famous bakery in San Francisco. And now he's done like 40 oh, yeah. food books. It's, it's wild. But food photography is, your book is so beautiful because it shows you guys in the farm, like 
you and Taylor in Oregon and then bringing this food to life. So we'll put pictures of this, at least on our Instagram for Wild Ideas Worth Living. But it's awesome. So let's talk about how you got a book deal, because I think there's a lot of people listening who are like, I'd love my blog to get picked up by someone at HarperCollins and become a book. And we have a friend who's a publisher at HarperCollins. So I kept seeing your book on her Instagram and I was like, wow, it looks beautiful. And I, it was just last week where I finally was like, oh, that's Andrea. It's really cool. So <laughs> maybe tell us how, yeah, how'd that happen? Yeah. You know, um, I had never really, when I set out, you know, my blog has been, my Dish Up the Dirt website has been around for, gosh, almost nine years now. Um, and I never had this end goal of, of writing a book. Um, to be honest, that sounded absolutely daunting. But I got approached by a literary agent who had been following my website for some time. And she approached me and said, have you, have you ever thought of about writing a, a cookbook? And I said, you know, not really, um, you know, but, you know, that's like, it's flattering. And it, it kind of excited me, um, you know, to think about it. But the more I thought about it, I said, if I'm going to write, go the, you know, if I'm going to publish a book, I definitely want to tell this farming story. I wouldn't just want a cookbook that's strictly recipes because I just felt like there was a story to be told, our farming story and how we got there and, and what it's like to, to really like live and work on a farm. So she loves that idea. And, and also the daunting part was to, I had to create all new content. So like the recipes couldn't be off mm. my website. It all had to be, That's hard. it all had to be new. Yeah. So it was kind of a crazy year, but I, I ended up getting a deal with Harper Collins. Um, I was thrilled. And like I said, going back to, I'm dyslexic. So I have a really hard time reading, but writing, I can, I can do a little bit more easily, but it was being, it was so hard to be organized. Um, it was a lot of work. I mean, writing a book is a lot of work, Yeah. but I'm really proud. You know, it, it was about a three year process. So anyone that thinks that like you get a book deal and then your book comes out six months later, <sighs> no, it's typically, it's typically a two to three year process. Um, and mine was, mine was about three years from when I, when I kind of got approached to when we signed the deal to when the book um, was published. I'm really, really proud of it. I think that it turned out really well. And yeah, I still kind of can't believe it's out in the world. Oh, it's beautiful. So Dishing Up the Dirt by Andrew Bemis. You'll have to check it out. We'll put it all over the show notes. I want to go back to this original question. Well, first of all, do you guys do farm to table dinners at your farm? Or is that something you'd ever do? We, we did one this last fall and it was absolutely awesome, but it was a lot of work. It, a ton of work. That's what I've heard. So there's a lot of local farms in San Diego trying to do that. And it's, it's a lot of work. And there's one farm, there's one company doing two farm tables and a microphone and they're doing speaking series events at these farms, which is really cool. So you like hear a oh, really cool that. speaker and then you, you eat at the table from at a farm like yours, where you guys would cook the food. Sounds like a lot of work. So any advice to people who want to be, you know, want to be farmers like me or even want to be gardeners? Like, Where do we even begin? Can we intern on your farm or someone else's farm? Yes. My biggest piece of advice is to, to go intern or get work on another farm, on a farm that's been around, that's already a successful farm or a working farm, because if we hadn't done that, if we hadn't, you know, learned the trade on somebody else's dollar and just decided to, you know, buy land and, and figure it out, we would have drowned. And I'm sure that there are people that can succeed doing it that way, but I wouldn't recommend it. We got a good, a good taste of, of what it would be like to be on our own working for somebody else. So my, yeah, I would definitely... There, and there's a lot of um, resources out there, too. There's programs that will set landowner. You know, if you want to also, uh, land is super expensive. That's one of the hardest parts about yeah. farming. So even if you know you can hack it, it's just it's finding affordable land. But there's actually a program, and at least in Oregon, I'm sure, and I'm sure if you Google this, 
if folks Google this, they'll find it in their areas, but it's called iFarm, okay. iFarm Oregon, but that's how we found the land that we leased. So it matches landowners with farmers. So, mm. you know, if people have the land, but they're not farming it, most people want their land farmed anyways, because they get the tax break. Ah, and it's a great way. Yeah. So it's a great way for, for farmers, aspiring farmers to work on, to work the land, but they're not making that huge investment. So that's, that's, you know, one way of getting in the door. And also so that you're not out, land is so much cheaper, the further away you are from a city, but that you have to remember, it's like, well, who's going to be buying this? Um, If we, you know, if we live four hours from, from a major city or a major town, you know, is that going to financially, somebody's going to have to be driving this there, you know, at least once a week and you know, you kind of have to figure all that out. So being able to find land in an area where there's a population is, is big. Yeah, we've been looking at Maui, but I don't know. You can grow. Oh, God, you can grow so much. I know. That's the thing is, is my, my, my partner likes tropical. I have this idea of like living in somewhere more like Raglan, New Zealand. It's just a little tougher there without being a New Zealand citizen. Him also I being an American citizen. I was like, well, we could just break up and marry someone else for a little bit. But anyways, so what other what other financial kind of breaks do you get being a farmer? I'm really curious. Like, you know, I know taxes are, you just said, are limited. You get a tax break for the land. Anything else? Yeah. Get a tax break for the land where we are. And again, I don't know what, where if this is across the board, but, you know, we um, are with like irrigation. We have kind of priority with um, in our area farmers get priority with water um, and we kind of get I know God California is in a totally different boat but we are lucky enough we kind of get unlimited water um, and then you know there's a lot of financial aid for or like a lot of grants for like infrastructure so like Interesting. if we want to put up another greenhouse which we were looking into putting up another greenhouse you can get grants for that you can get grants for we we just built a, a watering or a washing station. So like where we wash all of our produce, and we used to do that. We were exposed outside, and it was just this really silly looking makeshift washing station. And now we actually have a structure. It's more efficient. So yeah, you can get grants for for infrastructure as well. So what do you guys do for fun when you're not farming? What do we do for fun when we're not farming? We we hop in the car and we drive around and gawk at other people's farms. Uh, no, we, my awesome. husband, we, we live really close to Mount Hood. Um, and Taylor is a, he does ski patrol in the winter. Oh, that's awesome. So, so that's his side gig. That's his side gig. So, which is really awesome. So where we are, we get three full months off of farming. So we get, well, two and a half technically. Um, so two and a half months he's up on the mountain and he, that's his medicine. Um, and I'm convinced that that's what keeps him going the rest of the year. He does ski patrol and then you focus on your blog. Yeah. So I focus a lot on the website and then, and I'm a long distance runner and mainly in the winter. So I, um, I lace up the running shoes in the winter and, and get a lot of, a lot of runs in. And you run in the snow. And I run in the snow. Yes. You seem like the most badass beauty school girl I've ever met. That is awesome. <laughs> well, thanks, Shelby. I don't know about that. And I, 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 I say that with love. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really curious. So you have this really good social media presence as well. And I know there's brands who partner with you. Any advice to people who, you know, kind of want to have a social media presence and then they want to partner with brands about their passion, whether it's farming or whatever other wild ideas they have. Yeah, you know, and the social media, it, that's, that's a really big, important part of our business, actually. It, I think with social media, it's important to be consistent um, and relevant, but especially if you're going to partnering with certain brands, I think it's really important to be consistent with what your vision is on social media. Like, what's your message? What What's your business or, you know, staying true to what the core value of 
of what you're, why you're there. Because if you're all over the place, which I, you know, I know a lot of folks, you, you kind of dabble a little in this or a little of that. I think that brands really want to see what is your main, what's your main mission and staying true to that. And also to part, to not get so hungry and partner with a whole bunch of random brands, because I think people also see that and they're like, eh, but if you, if you're partnering with brands that are in line with, with your core values, I think that you can kind of be a little more selective with who you work with. But I think in order to grow your, your social following is, is to fo- first of all, follow folks that you, you are really inspired by and people that you're not inspired by, but you're following them maybe just because they have a lot of followers or I don't know. I say get rid of everyone that is making you not feel great. It's mm, good advice. Yeah, because you know when you're like scrolling through and you're like, oh, this isn't really making me feel good or I don't buy that or I don't know. I think it's it's good to to be following people that are inspiring and, and get you excited and then reaching out to them and just st- starting conversations. I mean, we do that with a lot of farmers. We'll see. We just recently converted our um, washing machine into a salad spinner because we saw some another farmer do that on Instagram. And so we just like, you know, reached what? out like, hey, dude, how'd you do that? And um, and now we have this awesome spin cycle lettuce. <laughs> so that is so cool. Yeah. So just, you know, following people that that inspire you and then to try and, and try and, and connecting with them. I like I'm blown away by the washing machine now as your salad spinner. That sounds like a way better use of a washing machine than just washing clothes. Totally. So I'm curious, you know, you guys are really productive. You do a lot in one day, you know, any routines that you do every day that make you the most Andrea that you just love to get in, in the morning, especially. And I know your morning starts at like before the crack of dawn. I love I like dream of my morning cup of coffee when I'm still lying in bed at night. So the first thing that we do in the morning is have our cup of coffee. You know, it's still dark out typically when we're drinking our coffee, but that's just like the most peaceful time of the day is, is drinking the cup of coffee before the chaos starts. And then, and then the other thing is, you know, we work our tails off sort of all afternoon and evening, but then we, our big happy hour people. So we'll crack open a beer at the end of the day. And once that beer is cracked, then it's like, okay, we're, we're clocking out because you can, we could be working until min, you know, the work's never done. And it's hard to find those boundaries of like, it's time to call it a day. We're not going to be any more productive if we keep working. So that cup of coffee in the morning and that, that beer in the, in the evening are the two things that we look forward to every single day. The simple, the simple life. Um, but yeah, that, that to me is like more exciting than like traveling to Hawaii. I'm like, I just need my coffee and beer. Yeah. I actually heard you say that on, on Gail's podcast, She Explores, which is one of my favorite podcasts. She asked you about dreams Mm -hmm. and you said, you know, your dream doesn't have to be lofty. It can be just, you want to talk about that rather than me butchering (laughs) it and trying to repeat it. Yeah. On, I was just interviewed on She Explores, and we were kind of discussing the, the topic of can you change your dreams, or you know how do you get to this your dream? And I that that question just started to like I was overthinking it. And I was like, God, what is my dream? And I kept thinking so big, like, oh man, should I? You know, do I want to travel the world, or I don't know. And then I was like, you know. I think that I'm living my dream, even though it's not glamorous, but I think for me, it's, it's the simple, it's the promise of a cup of coffee every morning and the promise of clinking glasses with my husband and dog at the end of a hard day. Um, it's kind of those little, those little daily moments that really don't seem that exciting, but in the end, those are when I'm the most happy. And so I feel like that is my dream. I just, I want to be happy in these small moments and not try and reach for some, some crazy, some crazy dream that there's nothing wrong with reaching for or striving for a crazy dream. But I just, 
I don't think I have that. I think that my crazy dream is, is what I'm doing. Yeah, it sounds like you are living your dream. And I appreciate you saying that because I think this show has confused a couple of people. Some people have been emailing me saying, hey, you know, some of these wild ideas are so wild and out of reach. <laughs> and the whole point is, you know, just to show there's a breadth of ideas you can have and dream. And I really appreciate that you like a simple dream, but it's not an easy dream. So I want to go back to that first question I asked you, you know, what has growing food taught you about life? Like, what are some of the most valuable lessons you've learned from, from running a farm? That this is, might sound cheesy, but that community is everything. We would not be able to make a living doing what we do if it wasn't for, for our community um, and for people buying our vegetables. And I, I, I had never thought about this. And even when we set out to farm the, I, you know, we grow food, we sell it. And then I thought then we would, we'd be done. We don't even think about where it's going or who's eating it. And now what's amazing is we've, we've grown this community of folks who they email us or they will tag us on Instagram with, you know, photos of what they prepared for dinner with our vegetables. And it is so rad to see our, our food, you know, turn into this beautiful meal on somebody that was a stranger that we didn't know, you know, a couple months ago. And now they're cooking our food and feeding it to their families. It's so powerful. And it, it really does. It keeps us going. You know, when the going gets tough, we just think of our, our customers and, and the folks who are supporting us through, through thick and thin. And I think I said this on Gail's podcast, but you know, we'll get text messages from CSA members when it's a hundred degrees outside and, you know, they'll, people will say, you know, I'm in my air conditioned office and I'm thinking of you guys today, you know, take care of yourselves. Oh. And it just, it brings it back. It's like, wow, there is this huge community. We're working to grow food for this family who, you know, they're in air conditioning right now. And they're thinking of us out in the field, growing their food. And we're all doing the best we can to support each other. And it's really, really rad. Well, it's really cool because you have a job that's really real. I think a lot of us have jobs that are kind of made up. But feeding people, that's that's about as real as it gets, growing food and feeding people to survive. That's awesome. You know, we ask all of our guests this, especially the females. I'm really curious. You know, 15 is such a weird age for girls. You're a sophomore in high school, usually you're a freshman. What advice, if you could give to your 15-year-old self and go back, what would you tell her? Oh, my gosh. I would, I would tell her to, to be kind to herself and to be kind to everyone else. I just think everyone, when you're 15, you're, it can be such a dark time. And, you know, I think I don't think I was very nice to myself. And who knows? how I was treating other people since I wasn't that nice to myself. So I think just being really kind to yourself and, and being patient. Well, I know what I would say. So we have a mantra that we say now that I really wish I would have been saying when I was 15, but we, in the morning, we don't say it every day, but we have this mantra where we say, it's a, we rule, it's all going to be okay. Get shit done. And I wish I could tell my 15 year old self, like you rule, it's all going to be okay. Get shit done because it, it you know, you got to get shit done to get to where you need to be. Even if you don't know where you're going, you just have to get your daily shit done, but that it's all going to be okay and that you rule. So I wish I was telling myself that. That's wonderful. Andrew, can you leave us with one of your favorite go-to recipes? Yes. You know, because we've been talking so much about kohlrabi in my cookbook, I have a recipe for kohlrabi fritters. Oh, those look so good. I looked at them last night. I sent it, <laughs> sent the picture to Johnny. I was like, let's make these, but bake them, not fry them. They're a great, they're a great, you know, anytime you're a little skeptical about a vegetable, just, you know, pan fry it or bake it. So they're kohlrabi fritters and I serve them with this kind of cashew herb sauce and they're like a great little appetizer. You could have it as a full meal if you serve it with a side salad, but they're a great introduction to kohlrabi. So I, I don't think anyone can, can knock kohlrabi if they give these a whirl. 
So maybe we'll put a little post about it in Instagram so people can find it or in the show notes. But Andrea, this has been such a pleasure. Where can people find more about you besides going out and buying Dishing Up the Dirt? People can find me. I'm pretty active on Instagram and I'm at Andrea Bemis on Instagram. And then my website is dishingupthedirt.com. And that is if you are struggling with how to cook through seasonal vegetables, you can, there's a section on the website where you can click on any vegetable. So you can click on like, there's a rutabaga category. You can click on that. And then all of my, you know, rutabaga recipes will come up or turn up recipes. So if you need some inspiration in the kitchen, yeah, the website is a good resource. Well, it's been such a pleasure, Andrea. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Shelby. It was great chatting. Andrea, thank you so much for sharing your story. We'll have links on where to buy Dishing Up the Dirt and find more on Andrea in the show notes of this podcast. We'll also post her kohlrabi fritter recipe sometime this week on Facebook and Instagram, so just find us at Wild Ideas Worth Living. Thank you to REI for sponsoring this show and encouraging us all to get outside and live more wildly. Thank you also to the awesome folks at Subaru. Not only do they make kick-ass cars great for the outdoors and even the farm lifestyle, but they actually introduced me to Andrea. So thank you, Subaru. Okay, so iTunes review nicknames are getting pretty epic. I'm really appreciating all you creative listeners out there. I'm so thankful for your reviews, and I'm loving the names you came up with. Kanoe Shinoe said, this is my favorite podcast. Someone also wrote, it's the best podcast to quit your day job. Sorry about that. There's some other great names. Piece of Ben, Tom Who Loves the Mountains, Om Sand Honey, Sacred Old Guy, Speedy G, and my favorite, Wish I Had a Trail Name. So you can write reviews as well and create hilarious nicknames. They definitely make me smile. And it really actually helps this podcast grow and stay free for you. So I hope you enjoyed this show. Also, that when you eat your next apple or orange or kohlrabi or broccoli from the market, that you remember some farmer grew that piece of fruit and vegetable and you give it some extra love before devouring it. We have some really big guests coming on. Have you ever read You Are a Badass or You Are a Badass with Money? Author Jen Sincero is coming on next week. Remember, until then, the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. See you next week.